Do you remember when you were in school, your math teacher gave you those hard questions to solve? There's a man on a train in Chicago, and he's traveling at 120 miles an hour towards St. Louis, and at the same time, there's another man with a high-powered rifle in Topeka. <laughs> and by this point in, in the question, I'd already made up my mind to answer C, <laughs> because everybody knows when you don't know the answer to those questions, C is your best guess. And, and please, you don't have to be a math genius to know that nobody with a high-power rifle in Topeka is ever going to hit anybody going from Chicago to St. Louis. No rifle's going to shoot a weapon that far. So you're already at a disadvantage because you know more than your math teacher <laughs> apparently knows. But, you know, that's math for you. I always enjoy those puzzles where finding the missing word or number, those were fun. Which word? I mean, let's do it together. Which word comes next? Bigger or big? Bigger, biggest, of course, and then small, smaller, smallest. But as I grew up, I learned that life's questions were more difficult than the ones we had on those tests. Life got hard in high school, harder in college, even harder as a young adult, even harder in middle age. And now that I'm nearly a senior citizen, I'm starting to discover that life gets even harder. But, but do you know what that struggle produces? Like all struggles, clarity. Because I found that the answer to all of those questions was the same. I found that in the blanks of life, you write in the name Jesus. You see, he's the simple answer for the very difficult questions of life. And when I find myself in those impossible moments, you know, I know deep down it's going to be Jesus. The Holy Spirit teaches me that. The Bible indicates that that's true. The church reinforces this truth. Life's questions are always answered the same way. Jesus, you don't answer math questions with Jesus because those are math questions, but you don't answer life questions with numbers. You answer Jesus' questions with Jesus. What am I going to do about my troubled teenager? Jesus. How am I going to interact with those difficult employees at work or a difficult boss? Jesus. Where will I turn when the doctor gives me bad news at my appointment? Jesus. What's the answer to my marriage problem? Jesus. How will I deal with aging parents? Still Jesus. And where will I go for answers when I don't have the resources to meet my needs? And the answer is Jesus. Life's questions are always answered Jesus. All of them. So let me go further and say it this way. When you think about your financial problems or your family issues or even the political drama in our world, when you think about interpersonal conflicts or even failing health, the answer to those questions is Jesus. Think about it this way. If Jesus were to appear today, all of those problems would, in essence, disappear. We sang about this already. The theme of so many of our songs, of our hymns, comes back to Jesus. We sang that it would be a glad day when Jesus returns. Joy to my heart will bring, no more sorrow, no more night, a glorious day, and oh, what a wonderful day it will be. We sang, when he comes, our glorious king, all the ransomed home to bring, then anew this song we'll sing. Hallelujah, what a Savior. We would still be suffering. We would still have pain. We would still have death. But Jesus, put down the biggest question life is bringing before you today, and in the blank put this answer, Jesus has just returned. And what does that problem look like now? 
You see, as Christians, this is our supreme hope. So point number one, Jesus is going to be here soon. And in fact, if you look at Revelation 22, look at what Jesus says in verse 7. Look right at the text. What does he say in verse 7? I come quickly. Look down at verse 12. What does he say in the text? I come quickly. Now look down at verse 20. What does he say in the text? Is it different? Surely. I come quickly. The word quickly indicates that this is true. It means to move with haste. You remember the story, Lazarus had died, Jesus had let him die, some days had passed, and Jesus and his disciples go to Bethany where Lazarus was buried. And when Mary hears from her sister Martha that Jesus had arrived, she quickly got up and came to see Jesus. She didn't slowly rise, she jumped to her feet and ran to see him. That is, she moved with haste. When the angel at Jesus' tomb told the women that Jesus had risen from the dead, he told them to go quickly and tell the disciples that he had risen from the dead. It wasn't one of those things where the ladies are wandering back, run into the disciples and go, now there was something I was supposed to tell you. There, there's real motivation to move quickly. It's not just an idea of going with haste. There's a sense of deliberation in this word. James encourages his believers in James chapter 1, be very slow to get angry, but be very quickly to listen. Jesus tells the church in Pergamos in Revelation 2 to repent or that he would come quickly to them and fix things in that church. There's a sense of deliberation there. I, I have a reason for coming. So I'm moving quickly, I'm moving with haste, and I'm moving with intent. So what we find there in this word, I come quickly, in that phrase we find both a sense of haste and a sense of deliberation. I'm deliberately coming to you. So what this is, men and women, is the doctrine of imminent return. When we talk about the imminent return of Jesus, well, it appears throughout the New Testament. Jesus promises his disciples in John chapter 14, I'm going away, but I will surely come again. I'm going to bring you to where I am. It, Paul writes to the Romans, he says, the night is almost over and the day is at hand. The dawn is near. Paul claims that the church in Corinth was actively waiting for Jesus to return. It wasn't something they thought would happen outside their own lifetimes. He claims that the churches in Macedonia were actively watching for Jesus to return in Philippians 3.20. Three times he refers in Thessalonians to Jesus returning. In 1 Thessalonians 1.10, the hope of the believers in Thessalonica, that his return imminently was a source of comfort for them in chapter 4 and verse 15 to 18, and that they were to watch expectantly for him to return in chapter 5, verses 5 through 9. Paul told Titus that this was the blessed hope, the glorious hope, coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. James told people suffering to be patient because, quote, the coming of the Lord draws near in James chapter 5 and verse 8. I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, this is absolutely true. Every generation of Christians have always believed that Jesus would come back in their lifetime. The fact that he has not returned does not change the truth that his return is imminent. You should be thinking this way. Years ago, evangelist Bob Shelton, who's now with the Lord, he would preach on end times teaching. 
eschatology. And he would go to churches, and if they asked, he would preach on the end times. And he had a series of sermons, and he came here uh, back when our church was small, and, and we were just beginning, and he preached a series of messages on the end times. And I learned a couple of things. The first thing was, he was such a nice man, I kept thinking, I just really want to end life like him. I mean, that, he's so nice. Everybody likes him. He's just such a nice man. I thought, I'm not very nice, but I want to be like that. That would be great. Until I heard him say this. He got up on the first day, and here's what he said. Now, I'm going to be preaching to you on the return of the Lord. And if the Lord returns during the meetings, pastor has agreed to finish the sermons. <laughs> And I'm thinking, you say that everywhere you go, but come on, man. <laughs> oh. In fact, I, I invited him to come back to the church. He, he couldn't at that point because of his health. But he said, I, I don't think I'll be able to make it. And uh, at first he didn't say why. And I, I wrote him back and I said, well, Dr. Shelton, we'd love to have you. Is there anything I can do to get you to change your mind? And he said, Oh, I, I didn't mean I was dying. I just thought Jesus will come back before then. I don't, I don't know that I'll be able to make it. And then he said, I, I, I actually have some health issues. I can't come. But he actively believed Jesus was coming back. And he believed it would be in his lifetime. And every generation of Christians have believed. Throughout church history, you say, is that really true? I, I will argue that the early church fathers while there were questions about the timing of these events, we're watching for the return of Jesus. Clement, in his first letter to the Corinthians in the mid-first century A.D., writes about Jesus coming back imminently. In the Didache, or the Didache, uh, in mid-first century document that's not part of our Bible, it talks about Jesus coming back. It, Cyprian, in the mid-third century, wrote about Jesus returning. The early church fathers thought about this. And what does this do for us? You see, the doctrine of Jesus' imminent return encourages us to prepare ourselves for the Lord's coming. He says again, I'm coming quickly, so blessed is he who keeps the saying of this prophecy. In verse 12, I come quickly and my reward is with me. And he which testifies these things says, I come quickly. What we learn here from these three different references to Jesus coming back is that we need to be ready for the Lord's return by learning and living out the scriptures in our lives. This is how we're ready, by actually reading what God has written to us and living those things out. We're ready by seeking divine rewards for living a God-pleasing life. Can I tell you, there's going to be a time when you will stand before Jesus and you will give account of your life. And while there's nothing negative that will be there, all your sins have been covered. I do believe Paul can say that it will be a terrible thing, the terror of the Lord, because we all want to go and stand and hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. But I don't think that's going to be for everyone. And I don't think everyone's going to receive rewards. And I think, and I believe this really is true, that a lot of the people who you think will receive the most rewards will receive the fewest and vice versa. I've told people, half joking, that I'm after crowns. I'm, I'm just running after crowns. You get... Crowns in Scripture, we, I've never really preached on crowns, but the crowns in Scripture are, are there. There's the soul winner's crown. You, you want one of those. And what about the pastor's crown? I get one of those. I told my wife, you know, you don't, there's no pastor's wife's crown. I'm really sorry. And that, that's when we decided that crown was the eye hath not seen and your ear heard, what the Lord has prepared for those who love him. Because pastor's wives, they go through a lot. I said, I'm going after that crown. There is a martyr's crown. I don't know how you go after that one. And that's the one where I'm kind of half joking. I tell people, if I guess if I had a life-ending illness, you know, just 
parachute me into Mecca with a bunch of gospel tracks, see how long I can make it, right? How long can you get? How far? Well, there's nothing wrong with that, seeking crowns. We, we, he says here, my reward is with me to give to every man according as his work shall be. I'm going after crowns. And then we're ready by defending the gospel against those who would tear it down. The one who is testifying the truth of this book is saying, I am coming quickly. And, and there have been people trying to destroy the gospel, and it's our business to stand up and defend it. And so I guess the question is, are you ready right now for Jesus to return? Are you ready because you've accepted the gospel for yourself? Because if you're not a Christian, you're not ready. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, you're not ready. Is there anything in your life that makes you think maybe you're not ready? Are you reading and meditating and applying the Bible to your life? Ladies and gentlemen, this is Christianity 101. This is the basics. But if you're not learning and meditating and reading and studying God's Word for yourself and only depending on what I give you on Sundays, it's not enough. And you need to do it yourself. Christians have, since they had access to scriptures, you should do this. What recent changes have you made in your life about the way you live? How have you changed in relationship to God's sovereignty in your life, his control over you? How has that truth changed your life, actually tangibly changed your life? What about the fact that you need to be going out and sharing the gospel with others? The fact that it is absolutely true that people are dying and going to hell today. How has that changed your life? How has it changed your life that you're supposed to be part of a local New Testament church? How has that changed your life? Are you actively involved or are you just kind of on the fringes? You see, how is your life being transformed by what you're learning from God's Word. I could ask you a thousand diagnostic questions like that. Has your understanding of God grown over the past few years? Do you know more about Him than you knew before? And have you matured in Christ in 2023, just last year? Are you more godly than you were? Are you closer to Him? Do you walk daily with Him? Can you honestly say that you're living for those divine rewards or have you not even thought about it? Can you defend the gospel? Can you even articulate what the gospel is? Could you explain to someone who doesn't know Jesus how he or she can come to know Jesus as Savior? Or do you just depend on that gospel tract that you have in your purse or in your wallet? Can you actively tell somebody about the Lord? Can you explain some of the more difficult aspects of the gospel truth? And what makes the gospel better than false religions? You see, ladies and gentlemen, Jesus is coming soon. Be ready. Be watching. Live every day. Looking toward the skies. Hoping. Maybe today. My Lord will come for me. Maybe today. My Savior, I shall see. Maybe today. From sin, I shall be free. Jesus will come. And I will go home. Yeah, it may be today. Now, Jesus is going to be here soon. Being ready is important. So... Let's hope it's really soon. This is point number two. You see, our greatest desire should be that Jesus comes back today. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. I, I'll even argue that if you hold to a doctrinal position that doesn't allow for Jesus' imminent return, there are some people who hold to different positions on the timing in eschatology. I would say you probably should still hope that it's today. Hope that you're wrong, even if you're not. Hope that way. You know, Charles Spurgeon, 
He was a Calvinist. That is, he believed that God chose who would be saved. I'm simplifying here and broad brushing the idea. But he had this idea. And he used to pray, Lord, save all the elect and then elect some more. You know, that's the right attitude, right? And I think no matter your doctrinal persuasion, you say, it'd be great if Jesus came back today. Let's hope he comes back soon. You see, we give a hearty amen to the promise of Jesus' return. Even so is the amen. Some modern translations put the amen in there. But even so, come Lord Jesus. Amen. Come Lord Jesus. It's a, a word of affirmation that the promise is true. Sometimes that word is translated truly. This is a true promise. It's trustworthy. You can count on it. Jesus is coming. It's the people who deny the gospel who say, according to 2 Peter, where is the promise of his coming? You you say he's coming back. All things have been the same since the creation of the world. Nothing has changed. Jesus is in here. God is in here. That's what unbelievers say. Do you know what godly people say? Come today, Lord. Come today. It's a word of affirmation. It's a word of hope. The desire of John, after seeing the vision of heaven unfold, is, okay, Lord, come right now. Come right now. I think if we had a full and complete understanding and picture, like John did in his mind, that is, we truly meditated and and applied the teaching of Revelation to our own hearts, it would be more than just, hope for people who are suffering, which is kind of the general theme of Revelation. It would be more than that. There would be this clarion call that would be always crying out from our heart, come back today. Start the process of changing the earth back to what it's supposed to be today. Be here today. This is the natural response of a believer seeing Jesus. You you think about this. The entire scriptures end with this thought. It's come back now. And, And that's sensed in the creative act of God. God creates the heaven and the earth and it is good. And God will one day restore the heavens and the earth to what it should be. And it will be good. And it's a little silly for us to go, it's okay to live broken when we can be restored. How many people wreck their car and say, finally, a little broken in. This is what I've been hoping for. I'm going to drive this car as long as it drives the wheels, you know, fender scraping on the ground. No hubcaps left. Big crack in the windshield. The trunk, you can't even open and close it anymore. And you think, that's exactly what I wanted. This car is unstealable. Nobody would steal it. No, that's not what you do. You want to get it fixed. You take it to a body shop, pound out all the dents, repaint the body of the car, get the engine working right again, get the wheels pointed straight again, get all that stuff working again, and you look, look at my nice car. It's been fixed. And that's what we're saying here. God comes back and he fixes it. And the cry of our heart is come and fix it. You know, you know it, it, this puts us back in the garden when mankind lived on the earth and walked with Jesus every day. And this whole end of scripture is this is what he will do again when mankind will walk on the earth as was originally intended and will live with Jesus in a personal relationship. We'll be able to physically see God. Through Jesus, even as Adam and Eve walked with Jesus to restore the garden back to the earth. You see, ladies and gentlemen, this is the ending groan of Scripture. John is expressing his desire. Come is an indicative verb, meaning an indication of fact. This is what I want. I don't want anything else. This is what I want. I think we've become so worldly-minded To not think this way. This is what you see all throughout the New Testament. The promise of God in 1 Thessalonians was taken so literally by some (laughs) that they were selling their houses and quitting their jobs. 
I'm just saying, okay, he's going to come back. <sighs> Could be any moment, so I'm not even going to do anything. I'm just going to sit on the ground. And, okay. Well, that was a little too much, obviously. But the Spirit is there. Paul had to make some correction in 2 Thessalonians to some of that thinking, but the Spirit is there. You see it all throughout Scripture. When Jesus leaves, what are his disciples doing at the ascension? What are they doing? Are, do they have their hands in their pockets? Well, they didn't have pockets. But if they had pockets, would they have had their hands in their pockets, looking down, kicking the earth? Woe is me. They had their eyes. They were, they were trying to see Jesus to the last second as he's disappearing out of their sight. And they're so busy looking up that angels have to appear and say, okay, time to get to work. <laughs> Why do you stand here gazing up into heaven? And then they said, this same Jesus, which you just saw go up into heaven, he will come back in the same way. And you will stand and there will be Christians like you stand one day and they will have their eyes fixed on heaven and they will see him come back. Now I'm going to tell you something. That is our groan. That's our desire. Come. This is what I want you to do. This is weird because John is making a prayer here that in any other context seems weird. Do, do you go to God and say, okay, God, this is exactly what I want you to do. I mean, um, my, I want you to heal my big toe. I want you to fix the headlight on my car. I want you to pay off my house. I want you to fix my kids. That's, I put that last because that's the big job, right? I, I, I've got, I've, here's, here's my list, and you must do it, God. I don't know that we, any of us pray that way. John's praying, okay, come back. Come back. Come back today. How can he pray that way? Because the promise is there. And so he can groan, he can cry out, come back today. This is what I want. He wants Jesus to return. His heart is in keeping with Jesus' promises. And there's nothing wrong with that. And, and friends, this is how we should pray. Come back today. That's how every Christian should be. Come back now. But what do we do in the interim? Because it's been a couple thousand years. And while our desire and hope is that Jesus would come back today, that's real, that's true. And, and we want him to come back real soon. There is an interim time that has been. And so John ends the scripture with these words. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with all of you. Amen. The interim between Jesus' leaving and coming is grace. God's favor be on all of you. This now is the benediction, a divine blessing. May Jesus be with you. You, you see, while we call for Jesus to come back, we remind ourselves that Jesus is always with us. As he said to his disciples, I want you to go. I want you to teach. I want you to baptize. And by the way, as you're doing those things, as you make disciples of the nations, I will be with you. Even in a time of difficulty in a church, when, when they are expelling one of their own members from the church, Jesus said, where you have gathered together in my name, I am in the midst with you. I'm present with you. How many people believers have sat in jail cells alone thinking how lonely they are and then remembering Jesus is here I can't see him physically but he's here because he promised me he would be how many people have been in difficult situations on a battlefield at life and death moments and feeling alone and then reminding themselves Jesus is here I can tell you, I was, during the Gulf War, and I've said this, probably it's been years, but I told you this story during the Gulf War. My dad had sent me a letter, and in the letter he reminded me of a psalm where God says that he will give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. He will, they will bear you up lest you 
kick a rock. I, I remember the night I got that letter, I was reading it. We, we had flashlights. They had little red lenses on them so they wouldn't be as visible to the enemy. I had my little flashlight. And those military flashlights, they're not straight. They go up and they turn, you know, so you have to hold them kind of funny. But I was reading this letter, <clears throat> and I'm really glad he didn't use red ink because I wouldn't be able to read anything. But I, 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 I'm trying to read the letter, and I'm reading this through this. And, I, and it actually kind of cracked me up because while I was reading on that, I, we had just received a shower unit. It was this large metal container that had a shower. Before that, we were taking showers. Um, well, we didn't take showers for about eight weeks of any kind. And then we got a shower unit, but it was a little awkward because it was only covering you up from about your shoulders to your knees. And there were plywood pieces, and we had female Marines. It was weird. I mean, hey, could you pass me the shampoo? Thank you very much, young lady. It's odd. That's weird, right? I mean, I'm going to tell you it's awkward. It's decent enough, but it's awkward. But here we were again, we were our own unit, and, the, and all the male Marines would go use it, and then all the ladies would, the few that we had, they would go use it, and, and it was separate, and that was good. And, and I had been at this, at this shower, it was the middle of the night, best time to go. I mean, things were happening day and night all the time. And I'm, and I'm leaving that shower unit, and I was walking back across the compound in my flip-flops, I had my flip-flops, I had, I had uh, 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 some clothing on and my towel thrown over my shoulder, which was wet and getting my t-shirt wet, and I kicked a rock and it cut my foot open and I was bleeding and it hurt really bad. And I'm kind of hopping around in the dirt. I mean, it's just dirt everywhere. I'm, why anybody wants that land, I'll never know. Why would you fight over that dirt? I couldn't figure that out. I mean, what geopolitical reality is this? But I know there's oil, so maybe that's it, right? So I'm, I'm hobbling back to my tent. I open up the, my mail. I open up this letter, and I'm reading, he will give his angels charge over you, and they will bear you up lest you kick a rock. And I went, well, there you go. I just kicked a rock. Now, I understand that the application of that verse is totally different from what just happened to me, Okay. That is not the right exegesis there. I get that. But it is kind of weird, you have to admit, right? And it did remind me of the truth of that passage. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide in the shadow of the Almighty. And when you walk with God, he's with you. He's right with you. And his presence with us is his grace. He, he's with us to the end of the world. And, you know, John must have felt that being in Patmos. I, I wanted to take, as many of you are interested in going on a cruise this summer, I've now planned it for next summer. It, I call it Paul's second missionary journey. It, you leave out of Athens, you go to Ephesus, Thessalonica. Um, you can go to Corinth because it's about an hour's drive from Athens. And so I was thinking this would be kind of fun. I found out in the middle of all that, you can take an eight-hour boat ride separate from the cruise and go to Patmos, the little island in the Mediterranean, in Patmos. And I said, well, I'm doing that for sure. I have no idea what the actual costs are, but I'm doing that for sure. Because are you going to give up maybe a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to stand there where John stood and to look out at the sea that John looked at when he's talking about a vision of beasts coming out of the sea? That's the vision he had? That, that would be really cool. I said, I'm going to do this. It's, it's maybe, actually, as the crow flies, some 50 miles from Ephesus. It's actually pretty close. He was marooned there, exiled there because of his stand for Jesus. But Jesus was with him there. Jesus' presence was there. His grace was there. So John says, come back, Lord. But in the interim, after come, he says, and grace. May God's favor be on you. So yes, let us hope it's soon. Let us pray that it be soon. But understanding that even in the moments that Jesus doesn't return, we need grace today to wait for Jesus to come back. 
We need God's grace for our health and God's grace for our career and God's grace for our family. We have to watch expectantly for Jesus to come back today. What's more important to you than Jesus' return? What has more value to you than Jesus' return? You go back to those math problems and you fill in your answers and the math equation gives you the answer. Go back to life problems and fill in the answer. It's Jesus. And understanding when Jesus comes back, he sets everything back to the way it should be. Let's hope it's soon. In fact, I got to the end of my Bible and then I noticed that the editors of my particular Cambridge Bible, this is the Cambridge edition of the 1769 King James translation. They've been printing this since nearly the beginning. This is a very old, old translation. Now, it's not an old Bible. It's probably 10 years old. It has a lifetime warranty. That's why I bought it. If it falls apart, they have to send me a new one. It's kind of nice. So I have this Bible, and I got to the very end, and then I went, oh, no. Oh, no. They made a mistake. What does it say after the period in verse 21? You see amen and then period? What does it say after that in your Bible? Does it say something? Is there anything left after that? Well, the editors of my Bible put, do you see it right there? You can't, probably can't see it. The end. And I went, no. <laughs> after all that, you got it wrong. The beginning. It's the beginning. All of this is prologue. All of, all of this is the introduction page. It's the beginning. The prayer for Jesus to come back isn't come back and then the end. It's come back at the beginning. And I thought to myself, sometime later I'm going to scratch out the word end and put in beginning. Fix it. But men and women... Listen to me, boys and girls. This life is only the start of a wonderful eternity. All of these messages have been meant to draw you to this fact that everything we're doing here is just, we're just kind of stretching for the race. <laughs> we're kind of, you know, getting ready to hit the first ball on the first tee. We're, we're, just, we're just warming up the car getting ready for the long drive. All of this is prologue. And so we do cry out, come back, Lord Jesus. But we know in that cry is not an end. It's not the last. It's not fini. It's the end of everything here. But it's the beginning of everything there. There's something that comes after Revelation. We haven't gotten there yet. It's not part of our Bibles. But we know from the Bible that it's there. And while we can't see it, we see through a glass darkly. But then, face to face. Face to face. I love what Fanny Crosby wrote. And I've got time so I can draw this out. I love what Fanny Crosby wrote. This blind poetess. Someday the silver cord will break and I no more as now shall sing. But oh, the joy when I shall wake within the palace of the king and I will see him face to face. And that's the beginning. Do you want it to start today? I do. I want it to start right now. I, I'm tired of the prologue. I'm tired of the introduction page. I'm tired of the table of contents. Bring me chapter one. And let me begin reading the great story of the Lamb. The great story, as Lewis wrote, of Aslan and his country. We look forward to that day. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. Lord.